You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Hello and welcome to the Hayek Program podcast. Today we're here to talk about the book, A Struggle for a Better World by Peter J. Becky, published by the Mercatus Center in 2021. Dr. Peter Becky is a distinguished university professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University, as well as the director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. We are also joined by three commentators, all scholars who have explored the ideas of liberalism, resilience, and social change in their work through theory, fieldwork, and history of economic thought. First, we'll hear from Dr. Emily Chamley Wright who's the president and CEO of the Institute for Humane Studies. Then Dr. Alan Marciano is a professor of economics and statistics at the University of Turin and a distinguished affiliated fellow with the Hayek program. And Dr. Mark Pennington is a professor of political economy and public policy and is the director of the Center for the Study of Governance and Society at King's College London. Welcome all of you today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your discussion. We'll begin with a brief discussion on the book by Pete. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie. I um, I greatly appreciate this, and thank you very much to Emily, Alan, and Mark, uh, whose opinions I respect very, very highly, and I look forward to your comments. I, I wanted to say something. Emily might remember this, but uh, you know, when I was in graduate school, at the very end of that period was when there seemed to be an increased heightened criticism of the Nobel Prize in economics. It was a phony prize and things like that. And Steve Horowitz and myself, we kept on telling everyone, yeah, 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 economics should win the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Peace Prize, because what economics really tells us about is how you get peaceful social cooperation. And in some sense, this is from our professor, Don Lavoy, is that actually the fulfillment of economics done properly fulfills the dreams, actually, of the left. So the problem with the left was it betrayed itself by having means that are unable to obtain its ends. But you know, radical economics, radical free market economics actually achieves that goal. There's actually a, a new book out uh, right now um, on left-wing visions of free trade. I'm going to hold it up, even though there's no video here on this. But uh, this is a very fascinating kind of conversation. So this book, uh, The Struggle for a Better World, uh, which I'm very grateful that the Mercatus Center uh, decided to bring out, it consists of essays over a 20-year period, so from 2000 to 2020, that I uh, wrote and had the opportunity to give primarily as addresses to scholarly associations. So they're not uh, necessarily my you know, original re- represent my original research as much as summaries of that research and its implications. And so, you know, I, you know, what was I trying to do when I tried to communicate to people when I was given a chance to give an address to the uh, a, an association? What did I want to stress? And so, the the term struggle um, has a dual meaning uh, in this uh, discussion, which is that I am struggling as a scholar uh, to figure out what are the institutions that can improve the human condition um, using the tools of economic reasoning. So one way, again, to stress this theme of of, uh, peace is Immanuel Kant, as you know, had these two sort of ideals, um, and and we're celebrating his uh, birthday this year, like the way we celebrated Adam Smith last year. Um, and Kant had these two ideas. One of them was strangers nowhere in the world, so the cosmopolitan ideal, and the other one was a quest for perpetual peace. And in my head, economics gives us the tools to be able to actually achieve those two things, right? And and the, the, what that is is to find the right institutional pattern that can simultaneously achieve both of those goals. And to me, that's the development of economics that has evolved from Adam Smith to today. 
The second point, and I struggle to figure that out because I don't know if I have the answer to that. And all these essays are various different bites of the apple to get at that issue. The other one is that as a citizen of a society, I want to sort of see what it is that it fulfills the liberal plan for equality, liberty, and justice that Adam Smith laid out for us. And so I want, this is the theme in the book that, uh, you know, we can repair a broken world. Um, so Alan will appreciate this. Jim Buchanan always used to say in our classes, he quoted this Frank Knight quote all the time, to say a situation is hopeless is to say it's ideal. But Buchanan, because of the constitutionalist project, also believed in the corollary of that was that since the world is not ideal, it's obviously not hopeless, and we can actually improve the world through changes in the rules under which we operate. And so I, I have struggled with that, and, and, and these essays reflect both of that scholarly quest and also the citizen quest for a better world. Crucial to my argument is an argument that is laid out by Lionel Robbins, in a book called The Theory of Economic Policy in English Classical Political Economy. And what Robbins argues in that is not just for the importance of the framework coming from Hume, a uh, framework in the treatise on human nature, where he defends the idea of property, contract, and consent as the foundation for civil society. But the fact is, is that economics, science, and liberal institutions co-evolve together. So if you just look at the history of it, liberalism in economics and in politics and legal system, they're co-evolving together. And so a large part of 20th century economics disregarded the importance of this institutional framework. So a large part of the rebirth of political economy in the post-World War II era was to bring those institutions back in. It's a, it's a kind of hard thing to explain to young scholars today because they all run around saying institutions matter. Uh, you know, that's just become part of the lexicon in, in the social sciences. But at the time when I first started studying economics, these were revolutionary thinkers, you know, people bringing it in. And if you look for the 20 years before I started studying economics, they were really revolutionary. They were so revolutionary, the other people didn't understand what they were saying. And so a large part of my book and efforts as a professional economist have been to counter this Samuelsonian hege hegemony in economics. And, uh, and that is to, like as Francis Bator, a Samuelsonian, put it, the goal of economics in the 1950s was to have an institutionally antiseptic economics. And so by bringing political economy back in, this is you know, one of the things that we refer to as mainline economics, which includes Coase and North and Buchanan and Tulloch and, you know, these Alchin and these various players and the very essays throughout this book draw on all these different thinkers, in addition to, of course, drawing on Mises and Hayek and Kersner tremendously. Okay, so what do economists have to say about social problems? So I'm talking about a struggle for a better world. I want to repair a broken world. A lot of people think economics has always been sort of, you know, blind to the social problems. But I try to argue in here, no, since Adam Smith, right, in this famous quote of Adam Smith, that no society can be flourishing and happy, of which the far greater part of the members are poor and miserable, is that the goal of economics was, of policy, was always to improve the lot of the least advantaged and most vulnerable in society, rather than the idea that it's captured by the you know, wealthiest and the elites that economics that properly understood is always trying to address his means ends. And the ends are always to improve the lot of life of the, of the least advantage and most vulnerable uh, among us. And so that's the kind of institutional pattern. That's what economics, you know, is sort of addressing. But it's always been a question of how do I minimize human suffering while maximizing human flourishing? So the most effective way to both ma minimize human uh, suffering and maximize human flourishing, and that's against the constraint of nature, so scarcity and trade-offs, against the, the notion that we must coordinate disparate and desperate individuals, disparate individuals, productive specialization, assuring cooperation among a multitude of strangers, the mutually beneficial exchange, and raising the welfare standard of the least advantage. This is peace and prosperity. 
So what I try to stress in these different essays all the way throughout is that it's important to stress that economics, science, from Adam Smith forward, was born in a critique of the privileged system of mercantilism. You know, Smith in the wealth of Na- in, a, in a letter uh, about the wealth of nations describes it as a aggressive critique against all of British commercial society. So a lot of people today hear that quote and they say, "Ah, oh, see, Smith, you know, he was he's with us. He's you know was a progressive, you know, uh, whatever." But Smith's what he meant by commercial society of all of British commercial society is a mercantilist society in which you had privileges and, and all of these issues like that. And so, you know, what Smith is trying to do is the birth of economic liberalism is the same as that of political liberalism, the eradication of obstacles created by power and privilege to enable the rise of commercial society, lift humanity from misery and poverty and subjugation by unchecked authority. This is a, ca- a case, Adam Smith's liberal plan of liberty, equality, and justice. And that's what the book is trying to really get at. And, you know, Mark, who's developed a whole book on this, uh, will appreciate this issue, which is that I see this as connected to the whole project of robust political economy. How do I build institutions that can, in fact, not govern if man were in perfect, uh, you know, harmony and all these things like that, but how we can minimize uh, the downside risk of power and privilege by putting constraints on that. And so a major quote from Hayek that has motivated all of my you know, writings on this robust political economy kind of idea and the notion of mainline economics is from his essay, Individualism, True and False, where he says that the main point about Adam Smith's idea is that bad men can do least harm rather than have a system where the best and the brightest, like the French notion of, of liberty, you know, as long as the best and the brightest are in power. Smith's concern was that um, how can I have it so that everyone can have freedom because we constrain the abuse of the uh, of 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 bad men being able to abuse the system, and so that's why the the reason of rules at some level and constraints and the tying of of uh, of the ruler's hands and how effective that is and when it breaks down. I don't really go into it here, but I think for people that will be listening to this. I, I, you know, this is, you know, the essays in here include some things that are kind of weird, actually, because they're not just all about liberalism. They're about like fiscal policy, monetary policy at different times. And one of the things that's fascinating to me is how those nitty gritty issues reflect this broader issue. So in the just take Hayek, Friedman and Buchanan's evolution in their thought on monetary policy, because they all at one time have great faith that they could find the right mix for the state to be able to control monetary policy. And they get frustrated and they they get frustrated and they get frustrated. And so eventually you end up with Hayek, of course, arguing for the denationalization of money. But, you know, Milton Friedman argued for free banking at the end of his life, too. You know, he went from a K percent rule to, like, get the government out of money. And Buchanan doesn't say get the government out of money, but he actually says, let's take money out of the policy space and put it in the constitutional realm. So, you know, it's because he's trying to safeguard the manipulation of money and credit by these special interest groups. And so it reflects this idea. So in a large part, what I'm asking you to do is is in this essay is think through that logic about money. Think about it with regard to the tax state. Think about it with regard to legal centralism. Think about it all these different ways, right? And so, anyway, that's, you know, kind of the, the why the nitty gritty all constrain back to this robust political economy point. And so one of the lessons, and this relates to my history of my work, even though it's not really reflected in these essays, is that I was born as a Sovietologist. That's how I started out. And so to me, I think one of the most important issues to straighten out is that socialism's not the answer. So, you know, what we can't do is we can't turn to the state to fix problems that are created by the state. <laughs> the dysfunctions of the state are not fixed by more dysfunctions. You have to find some alternative mechanism. And the task for us has become more, you know, I, be us, I mean, let's say the younger generation, the PhD students that I'm training today, 
have a much more difficult task than the task that I had. And that's because in the last 20 years or so, the tacit presuppositions of political economy have flipped. So I begin the book with an epigraph from Hayek, which is about this issue of the tacit presuppositions of political economy. And at the time that I started economics, I, I, I this is one of the essays in the book. It's about comparing you know, Milton Friedman's free to choose reception today versus today, you know, today versus what it would be like when I was a student. But like, just think about like when I was a student, the idea that you would ever turn to politics as a solution, a romantic solution to social ills just didn't make any sense. All right. Because we just had, I'm not a crook, right? We had, you know, uh, the Jerry Ford, you know, falling down the steps of of, uh, you know, Air Force One. And so he was considered to be a bumbling idiot. Then you had Jimmy Carter, you know, and then we had the malaise of the 1970s. And so the idea was that you weren't going to turn to the government when, you know, when Ronald Reagan said things like the worst words you can hear is I'm from the government, I'm here to help, right? That resonated with young people. Today, think about the alternative. They've grown up with what? Post 9-11, so a permanent war economy, then the global financial crisis, and then the COVID crisis. So to them, they have to think that the, they need a big boss. They need someone like that. And so this tacit presupposition, what that reflects is, is kind of, you know, when I was learning economics, it was kind of like a screen door that was unlocked and you were pushing open that screen door. Today, the kids that are learning how to be professors to teach about the power of liberalism, they're facing a steel door that's like double locked. And all you have to do is look at like on the college campuses today and, you know, even compare and contrast the way in which the rhetoric of the anti-Vietnam, you know, protests of the 1860s versus the sort of protests that are going on today. The rhetoric is different in terms of the way you think about that issue. It's, it's not so much today is, you know, a peace project as much as it is. Um, and overturning, you know, one side or the other side project. But we don't have to talk about that. That's a whole issue in itself. So at some level, what I'm asking in this book is who are going to be the adults in the room? So monetar- this goes back to the, you know, the nitty gritty qu- uh, essays in there. Monetary mischief and looking at the balance sheet of the Fed, fiscal irresponsibility and the notion of intergenerational accounting the pathology of privilege and the structural distortions to the system that are created by that. And so that then, you know, leads us to this issue. As I said, the answer to our dysfunctions is not more dysfunction. It's, it's, we have to find some alternative. And that alternative in the struggle, to me, I think comes to us is what's our task. And these are my last two things I'll say. So uh, the first thing is as liberal political economists, I hope that my essays communicate to people the importance of learning from Milton Friedman, from Jim Buchanan, and from Hayek. I think we have to learn from Friedman the ability to think and communicate with clarity and compassion to your peers, to your students, and to the general public. We should be able to explain to you know, our, the general public what it is that's important about our propositions and our science. Okay, so Milton Friedman was able to do that. We have to learn from Buchanan, which is to have the daring to be different, to challenge the elitist presumptions and caution fellow economists on becoming their own version of elites. (laughs) That is, uh, you have to cease offering policy advice as if to a benevolent despot. And that's true whether or not I'm a progressive Keynesian or I'm a Buchanan constitutionalist. I, I, I have to instead step back from that elitist presumption. And those elitist presumptions are, you know, the utilitarian, social engineering, elitist preferences. And Buchanan was very good in, in highlighting those and asking us to challenge those. I think we have to learn from Hayek, especially the, the Hayek of intellectuals and socialism uh, in the way I read that essay, which is a little different from a lot of other people. But we have to excite the minds of the next generation of thinkers with a sense of awe about the market order and a sense of purpose for the practice of the science of economics. Again, Adam Smith told us that science advances from wonder to surprise to appreciation. 
And I think if you look in the 20th century, the economists that opened our eyes to the wonder of spontaneous order, a surprise at the mechanisms that make spontaneous order come about, and then an appreciation of spontaneous order for a free society was Hayek. And so I think in that regard, the two you know, great thinkers is, is going to be you know, Smith and then Hayek, and we should learn from Hayek about how to excite the minds of the next generation. And I think to, you know, to think boldly, like how far can I push spontaneous order analysis outside of this idea? And then the last one is, and I think this, I hope this comes across uh, in the essays. I think this is also a very important lesson from Friedman, which is from Adam Smith. I think when we read Adam Smith today, one of the things that strikes us is his kindness and his generosity of spirit in the, th- in the theory of money, uh, th- theory of moral sentiments, and his analytical acuteness and historical judgment from the wealth of nations. And to me, I hope that we, as liberal political economists, present our work with the same kindness and generosity, while also being analytically acute and have the historical judgment that Smith had. The final thing that I want to say, uh, and this is at the end of the, the book, is that it is a message in the end about that we've been teaching economics the wrong way. Right? This is the problem. The reason why we're in the mess that we're in today is because we've taught economics the wrong way. Right? We taught economics in this way that fit with, the, uh, with a non-self-governing democratic society. This is one of the real powers of the Ostroms, is that their view is that the science should be judged of whether or not it's worthy for a self-governing democratic society, not a bureaucratic, you know, uh, progressive Error sort of economy, uh, you know, in which you have a uh, established elites who then are immune from democratic pressures to be able to impose the correct policies on everyone else. And so I think that we need to teach economics in a better way, a more exciting way to young people, you know, rather than turning people off to economics, we need to be bringing them in uh, to, to economics. And the way to do that is to teach them with these four pillars which is the truth and the light about scarcity and trade-offs, the awe and the beauty about spontaneous order and complex coordination, uh, the hope that is provided by entrepreneurial innovation and technological advancement, sort of the great fact of history and the hockey stick, uh, and what that does. You know, here, here's just a simple thing is that uh, in 2015 was the first time in world history that less than 10% of the world's population was living in extreme poverty, all right? When I was a gra- uh, uh, an, an undergraduate student becoming beginning graduate student, that was closer to 40% of the world was living in extreme poverty. We don't talk about that enough. And that is a, a modern miracle that's amazing. And we should talk about it. That doesn't mean that the people on the, it, it, that are, you know, in situations of, just being above extreme poverty or not still struggling. But it's still the case that it's an amazing thing that you're not living in extreme poverty. And then finally, I think that we need to teach economics with compassion, so that we need to make it clear to everyone that our goal is to improve the welfare of the least advantaged and most vulnerable, and that the way to do that is through the eradication of privilege and the turning over of the power of the market. And so... I think that we can do a lot better job teaching economics, and I hope that my book at some level is a uh, communicates that through these essays that I've had this great opportunity uh, to give over the last 20 years. And anyway, thank you very much, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. So uh, I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Uh, this is Emily Chamley Wright, and I am just so thrilled to be here with you all and in large part because I consider Peter Becky to be among the most important intellectuals of our age. And when I say that, I don't just mean, uh, you know, people around our age. I mean, literally in this moment of where we're seeing illiberalism spiking at both extremes of the ideological divide. You know, when I came up as a as an economics professor or graduate student before that, you know, as an Austrian economist, I always knew that there would be resistance to uh, market-based philosophical approaches to solving problems in the world. That was sort of just part of, you know, 
the, the landscape that we were operating in. But I assumed and I felt like I was on pretty firm ground here that there was a, com a common understanding that what good looked like was still that we would be operating within a liberal society, even if we had deep disagreements about what the optimal economic policy uh, was, that there was lots to fight about, but uh, still a lot that could be assumed as common ground. And I don't think that that's true anymore. And so it's for that reason that I, I'm so excited that this book is getting the the airtime and the exposure that it it needs, and uh, Pete's work throughout his his intellectual career has been that making that contribution, making the case for the good society, and that that good society is one in which uh, individuals and communities flourish. Yes, in a context of prosperity, widely shared prosperity, but also in a context of peace and toleration and mutual respect. And that's really where I'm excited about the contribution of this particular book, because, as Pete noted, you know, the, the struggle that we that he identifies in the book is that uh, is to find the identify the institutional rules of the game and the cultural norms or liberal virtues that are that allow free and responsible people to prosper through their voluntary participation in their market and their civic lives. Now, what emerges in the book is a kind of uh, is a kind of formula of general rules that constrain public power and unleash private creativity and balance a high degree of contestation at all levels of governance. So that's sort of like all wrapped up in the general rules of the game of the liberal order. But he's also very clear to bring into view of the reader the importance of liberal virtues as well. So a commitment to that we are one another's dignified equals, all of us, that the commitment to equality, humility, openness, toleration, and that those two things, the general rules plus the liberal virtues, when they combine, the case I want to make today is that it moves, it, it helps us to understand that liberalism is a system. It's a coherent system that generates social learning. So what do I mean by social learning? By social learning, I mean a society that achieves a level of coordination and cooperation that far exceeds any individual's ability to intentionally design. So uh, a social learning is where society as a whole becomes more intelligent in some ways than even you know, a committee of the smartest experts within that society because it emerges out of bottom-up processes, a system of uh, course correction and, and regulation that far surpasses our ability to design and control it from the top down. And so to get at that, and this is where, um, if you're listening on the podcast, where I would invite you to go to the show notes because what we're going to include there is a visual of what I call the four corners of liberalism. It's kind of a map, right? So, um, so if um, if you're driving and can't safely uh, read the show notes, let me describe it really, really quickly. Think of a of four four directions of a map. Um, at the southwest corner is political liberalism. At the southeast corner is economic liberalism. At the northeast corner is intellectual liberalism. And at the northwest corner is civic liberalism. Now, going to the southwest corner, the political liberalism corner, is the most familiar to the general public. It's the, it's the space where we identify what good looks like with respect to government, that government's role is to protect individual rights, not bestow them, but to protect them. It's the arena in which we guarantee procedural fairness through general rules. It's the arena where we have constitutional constraints that limit government power and keep authoritarian populist impulses in check and leaves a wide scope of it uh, for the individuals individuals to have the elbow room they need to pursue their preferences and plans. Now, jumping over to the economic liberalism, very familiar to this audience for sure, less familiar to the general public, is uh, that in the economic liberalism corner, this is where we've got, so long as you're not harming others, tremendous freedom to in innovate, produce, to exchange with one another, 
And this is the, the arena that unleashes that astonishing hockey stick of human betterment that uh, Judah McCloskey writes about and that Pete was describing earlier. Going up to the north East corner to intellectual liberalism. This is where John Stuart Mill's insights are really helpful. You know, when we have the freedom to engage in the open development and exchange of ideas, good things happen. Good ideas get better, bad ideas get weeded out, social and scientific progress unfolds. We get more than just, and it's more than just freedom of speech in this intellectual liberalism corner. We get you know, informal systems of governance, of truth-seeking communities like academic communities when they are at their best, that emerges within this intellectual liberalism corner as well. And hopping over to the Northwest corner of civic liberalism, this is where we find associational life of family, neighbors, volunteer groups, thick commitments like our, our commitments perhaps to a religious community and thin commitments, you know, our involvement in a sports club or, um, you know, a neighborhood play group. So this map, I think, is helpful for us to recognize. And I think this is one of the things that comes through in the struggle for a better world is that, that when we talk about the liberal project, we really ought to have in mind all four of these dimensions. So the first point I want to make is that Social learning unfolds within each corner of the liberal project. So if you're familiar with Buchanan's constitutional political economy, for example, the, this, the, the case that he, that he makes here, the case that you know, centuries earlier that James Madison made, that scholars like Vincent Ostrom make in, in around federalism, is that political liberalism is one where we have learning because we've got divided and dispersed decision-making authority. We've got a dispersion of power so that no one entity has so much power that it is freed from any contestability. And that's, the, that's really the theme of social learning that, that's the first important theme of social learning is that the reason why a, a liberal society is one that learns is because it's also one it, that is in a constant state of contestation. And so that separation of powers, that divided um, authority is a, is a huge piece of that puzzle within the political realm. Jumping over to the economic liberalism corner, again, this will be very familiar to those who are listening, uh, who know uh, the works of Adam Smith and F.A. Hayek, the Austrian school generally, the knowledge problem critique that Hayek was making was to make the case for economic liberalism or market society is one that learns that it is the arena in which uh, through um, market contestation that society as a whole is capable of generating a level of coordination and cooperation that we could never design through a kind of uh, socialist top-down planning model, right? So there's social learning that happens in the, in the economic liberalism corner as well. Jumping up to the intellectual liberalism corner, again, Mill's helpful here um, because his, his arguments are that, you know, like when we have intellectual openness, when we have intellectual freedom, we become smarter individuals because our errors get corrected and our, if we enter into the conversation already with the right point of, with the correct point of view, um, you know, that, that sense of the truth becomes all that sharper and lively. So, so we as individuals get smarter, but what, you know, the, the thing I'm trying to get at here with the social learning point is that society as a whole gets smarter. And so for that, Michael Polanyi's work, The Republic of Science, is a really good touchstone for understanding that, that embodied within the community of scholars, say, with, with their commitment to honesty, engaging in the fair dealing of ideas, and, and it's the free exchange of ideas, but it's also that we're fair traders in this exchange, that intellectual communities come to embody a wisdom that far surpasses any one intellectual within the community. And similarly, uh, the Ostrom's work, the Bloomington School, uh, hopping over into the civic liberalism, corner gives us an understanding of how 
uh, governance can emerge, how we can solve complex social collective active pro action problems, for example, through bottom-up systems of government. Sometimes those problems can get solved through, through a, a sort of governmental process, but that's not the only way a lot of our problems can get solved. And so that's the insight from the Bloomington School. But again, the wisdom is generated, or the wisdom is captured and embedded not just in the minds of individuals, but it's embedded within the social rules of the game. And so that's the first point is that social learning happens within each of these four corners. But the next point I want to get at is that social learning also unfolds across the four corners of the liberal project. And that's why in the visual uh, of the map, there are lines connecting each corner to each of the other corners. So for example, you know, think of the relationship between academic freedom that's found within the intellectual liberalism corner of the liberal project and the First Amendment guarantee of freedom of speech that's found within the political liberalism corner, right? That you can't have intellectual, you can't have academic freedom if you don't have a a baseline necessary commitment to um, freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is no guarantee that you're going to have academic freedom, but it's a baseline. It's a baseline condition, and so you can see how these two corners of the liberal project connect to one another. Another quick example would be the connection between intellectual liberalism and economic liberalism. The good things that come from economic liberalism, that hockey stick depend in part on intellectual liberalism and vice versa. Intellectual progress happens more rapidly when we have enough economic abundance to, to sustain intellectual labors. And at the same time, the, the intellectual liberalism generates discovery and scientific progress that fuels economic liberalism and the betterment of our economic and material lives as well. So that's another way in which we can see how these two things connect. One other example of reinforcement that needs to be said, again, in this company is the connection between um, economic liberalism uh, and political liberalism. Economic liberalism relies on good rules of the political order. For example, well-defined uh, and enforceable property rights, that's essential. And at the same time, uh, economic liberalism also connects to civic liberalism because associational life also matters in the market process. There's lots of stickiness in market interactions from asymmetric information to principal agent problems to credible commitment problems. Good contracts certainly help to overcome some of these challenges. You know, the contract piece is embedded within the political liberalism corner, but so does a high degree of social trust, which comes from the civic liberalism corner. So both political liberalism and civic liberalism fuel the, the benefits that emerge through economic liberalism. So this is another example of the sort of positive reinforcing effects across the four corners of the liberal project. The next point to pay attention to though, and this is where I think it gets really interesting, is that the, just as there's reinforcing positive um, positives across these four corners, there are also tensions across the four corners of the liberal project. And the case I wanna make is that these tensions are a feature, not a bug, right? So for example, let's consider um, freedom of speech, which is so important to, as a, re as a positive reinforcement to a robust civic life and a robust liberal civic order. But freedom of speech can also be in tension with our civic desires for civility and liberal norms. You know, bigots get free speech rights too. And that fact puts political liberalism in a kind of tension relationship with civic liberalism. But this is one of the reasons why, if you do have uh, access to the show notes and the, and the graphic, why I curved some of these lines to kind of give you the, the, the sense that the relationships that were uh, forming across these four corners is kind of like a suspension bridge. When you think about what a suspension bridge does, it does two things. It's, uh, it makes sure that, that we can withstand the uh, heavy load and flex and bend as, as the external or environmental conditions 
um, change, that happens in part because of the reinforcing effects, but it also happens because of the tension. So that's what I mean by the tensions are part of the system. They're not opposed to the system of the liberal order. So let me give you just one example here, and that's that the tension that many post-liberal critics of the liberal order offer is this tension between autonomy and civil society. Uh, the argument is that liberalism has destroyed meaning-rich community life by making it too transactional. We are so focused, we liberals are so focused on individual freedom and autonomy that we've become completely untethered to our civic lives. This argument, though, ignores the positive role that autonomy plays within with helping to create a humane civic order. So there's an important step we have to take here. I'm a big fan of robust civic life. I really want to make sure that I live in a, in a, a society where neighbors know each other and we, and we care about one another, or family members are connected and, and offer support uh, to the people who need support. That is a source of meaning, rich uh, and, and purposeful connection. And at the same time, we need to be willing to see civic life without the romance as well. Just as it can be, civic life can be in a, when it's at its best, the source of purpose and meaning. It can also, they can also be sites where power is wielded, resources are extracted, and social costs are imposed upon those who don't comply with group norms and expectations. Autonomy creates a discipline through the threat of exit in some cases and just through the uh, contestation of other civic groupings competing against the existing civic groupings to identify ways that if a civic group is overburdensome, if it's um, exercising authority against certain members, putting too much of a burden on certain members, prescribing too much conformity to certain standards that don't allow people to flourish as individuals, that exit option is incredibly important to act as a discipline against overburdening and overbearing civic relationships. And so its autonomy is not the enemy of a robust civil society. It is the friend of a, human, of a humane, robust civil society because it's introducing a level of contestation in civic life. So I'm gonna pause there, mostly because I wanna make sure that there's enough time to hear from the other panelists and, and if there's some discussion that can happen, that would be great. Uh, but this is just to plant that seed that the liberal order is one in that through its reinforcing connections and through its uh, tensions creates a coherent system of social learning that allows liberalism to hang together. So going back just to this, this final point, that we do want lots of autonomy, and we want that autonomy tempered by robust com and meaningful commitments within civic life, but we also want a robust civic life, but we want to have autonomy too, because a robust civic life can become very quickly authoritarian and clamp down on human flourishing. And that's something that liberalism wants to correct for as well. And that's why uh, civic life needs autonomy too. So it's in this way that the tensions across the four corners of the liberal society not only reinforce each other, but also keeps each corner from spinning out of control. It's, there's a kind of tethering and anchoring that happens across the four corners that keeps the system of liberalism in a coherent whole and able to adapt, able to withstand a heavy load, even as it's, and, and also maintaining its integrity as a system. So let me stop there. Great, thank you, Alon. Yes, let me start by saying uh, that I am really honored and grateful to be here to talk about this book, to talk about its work. First of all, because I think that just like Emily said, it's a very important work, uh, 
the quality of his work is uh, very important. The honesty, the intellectual honesty of what Pete is doing is very important. And we need this kind of work. And I am also grateful because being here gave me the opportunity to read again the book that I had read when it was, it was published. And it's uh, always incredibly interesting, incredibly rich, as I remembered. And it provided me with some elements that I had not forgotten, but I tend to forget uh, when I am not reminded them. One of the reasons for which I tend to forget these elements is precisely uh, one of the points that Pete make, makes in his book, is that we are living in a world that is not a liberal world. And speaking of, I'm speaking from actually Italy, but France is not I was I lived in France for a long time, and I uh, France is precisely not a place, the place of Tocqueville, the place of Montesquieu, but the place in which liberalism has been uh, lost off sight for decades, at least for decades. And I am also grateful because I was recently asked to uh, speak on a, a panel about uh, ecological planning, which is rather important uh, political thing in France recently. And there is everything in this book that is needed to explain if it's still the case that we have to explain that. That is why ecological planning cannot work, why it cannot be a solution to the problems of climate change that we are facing. But let me start with, I will uh, go back to the, we start with the title of the book, uh, Struggle for a Better World. And actually, there are two words in the book, and uh, in the title, and two words that are uh, fundamental to understand why the book is, uh, is important. First, this, this idea of uh, a better world, which means that the world in which we are living is not uh, the, the best possible world. Uh, and it's uh, not the it's a word that should be changed because it's no longer, a, a, it's not a liberal world. Uh, liberalism is threatened by illiberal ideas on its left and on its right. And uh, one of the aspects, one of the dimen dimensions that Pete explains very precisely and clearly in the book is that the liberalism as liberal, liberal ideas have lost their appeal. So we need to, stri to, to struggle for this better world because liberalism is no longer there, which means that the, we live in a world that is no longer uh, organized by uh, the principles of classical liberalism, by a form of liberalism that is no longer liberal because it's no longer classical liberalism. And therefore, we live in a world in which peace, openness, cosmopolitanism uh, are no longer present. There is no longer a possibility to debate or to discuss. I don't know which uh, word should be used, but one of them is not the, the, uh, the correct word. There is no place for a debate because there is, we live in a world in which we have one side against the other, one side who is right, the other who is wrong. And when the debate or the discussion starts by opposing the ideas to, uh, that the other is presenting to you, then no discussion, no debate is, is possible. So we need to struggle that. We need to struggle to uh, reestablish a debate. Some people claim that we should go, go back to a form of democracy that is based on discussion, that is based on debate. But precisely, this is no longer possible because we are no longer living in a society that is organized around the principles of classical liberalism. So before starting to debate, before starting to reinstall uh, the importance of discussion uh, in our democracies, we need to start by reinstalling, re-adopting the principles of, uh, principles of classical uh, liberalism. This is why we have to struggle. And the, the, the very idea that it's, it's a struggle shows important what the, the, the problem is. It's not going to happen easily, and therefore we have to fight to go back to this situation in which 
uh, the principles of classical liberalism uh, rule. What is interesting is that what is important is that it's precisely it's a fight about ideas. It's not uh, something that is physical as it happens now. We are fighting against others to make our ideas uh, stronger, to make our ideas uh, win. But it's not, this fight is not physical. This fight is uh, intellectual. Uh, it go, goes back to the idea of debate I was mentioning earlier. This is something that the, 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 the Beats book makes very clear that we have to uh, discuss, we have to talk to the others to present the ideas that we think are important. So one of the extremely interesting uh, points that uh, is made clear in this book is that the principles of classical liberalism can be presented in a way that is appealing to the other people to install a debate, to install a discussion. And what I, I also find particularly interesting is that uh, all the essays that Pete presents in the book are not essays that were all published in academic journals, which means that we have to talk to different audiences. We do not have to talk only to our colleagues, to our peers, even if it's important because most economists uh, do not really know what economics is about, are confused about what economics is about. This is something I will uh, come back to uh, later, but this is, the, this is one of the problems. But the problem is also that we should talk to different people, not only to other academics. We should talk to other audiences, and this is what the book does. It's, not, uh, it's a very important book for economists. It's a very important book for uh, classical liberalism. It's a, book, it's a book about liberalism. It's a book about, about classical political economy. It's a book about both. But it's a book that speaks to uh, people who are ready to learn without being too technical, without being too uh, sophisticated. And at the same time, by being very uh, sophisticated, uh, sophisticated and very important. One of the things that I like very much in the book is that it's, uh, it's, it's about economics because it shows that economists were the, the ones who were the, let's say, responsible or the crisis of liberalism in which we are today. The, the, the importance of the book, the importance of talking about classical political economy, classical liberalism, and classical political economy is that uh, economists have lost one of the reasons that explain the situation, that explains the situation in which we are, is that economists have lost the, their way. Economists have lost the, 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 the sense of what uh, economists economics should be. They are doing, to paraphrase, of course, the, the Buchanan's book, uh, Buchanan's article in Buchanan's book, they, economists do what they do. They do not really think about what they should be doing. And they uh, replicate the way of doing economics that has been done for uh, four years since, not since Adam Smith, but since Varas, and since the emergence of uh, general equilibrium uh, theory. This is one thing that I find uh, that I like very much in the book that I find crucial. The process that, uh, the, the, the beginning of the, the, the process of decay in economics started with Varas, with a general equilibrium theory. It accelerated in the 20th century with Keynesian, Ken, uh, Keynes and Keynesianism with Pigou, uh, with the, the, the sophistication of mathematical economics, with the development of game theory, well, we could add with the development of the use of stati statistical tools in economics. And I think that also today, the development of uh, experimental, experimental economics is also a problem because it uh, reinforces this idea that uh, this wrong view about uh, what economics is. And of course, there is uh, Samuelson in all that, who uh, played a very important role in the transformation, transformation of economics in the 20th century. What Pitt emphasizes in, in the book, what the struggle for a better world emphasizes, is that economists started to see their discipline uh, as a, a discipline uh, about uh, problems to solve. So 
it's it is not that clear who were the economists who saw economics as a problem as a, a problem solving science a lot of economists in the 20th century saw their discipline in this way economics is about the allocation of resources certainly but there are different ways of seeing economics as a, a, a science that speaks about the allocation of resources economics is about uh, equilibrium about the how to reach a certain situation this is the point solving the solving problems is finding uh, an optimal situation is also believing that economics uh, it's also believing that economics are uh, saviors as Pete says in the book is also believing that when there is a problem when economics does not work properly Econ when the society does not work properly and the economy does not uh, works, uh, work properly, then economists are the ones who are able to fix the problem. In the, in the 1920s, the idea that uh, was the market system was failing. That was the, the 1929 crisis led to the idea that the market system was failing. After the Second World War emerged the idea of market failures. The market failure idea is usually not very well understood. And this is also, again, another point that is crucial in the book that explains precisely why the idea of market failure is not what is not understood properly. Usually economists and social scientists believe that the market failure idea, the concept of market failure is a means to limit the role of the state and to limit the role of the government. Speaking of market failure should imply that the role of the state is limited, limited to correct and to solve these problems. But that's, that is precisely the reverse. Someone, someone like uh, James Buchanan believed that market failures are not a problem. Why market failures are not a problem? Because individuals are always uh, uh, capable of solving the problems they face. Interestingly, this is also why these days hope in this struggle, because and this is the, what the, the liberals uh, say and what the illiberals uh, refuse. Samuelson, for instance, was the first to say, more or less the first to insist on this problem. Individuals are potentially all free riders. Individuals do not want to cooperate, which is precisely the problem individuals there are market failures not because the market failed the market system fails there are market failures because we assume that individuals do not want to cooperate buchanan for instance one of the economists on which uh, the struggle for a better world relies very much buchanan believed that we should trust individuals we should trust individuals because and if there is hope, it's because we should trust individuals. We should trust individuals because individuals are always able to find solutions to the problems they face without requiring any external intervention to solve these problems. And again, the struggle for a better world insists very much on the confusion that creates this uh, concept of market failures. Once you see the, the economy as potentially failing, you think as an economist that you are the one who is able to solve the problem. That's the, uh, exactly what the liberals do not do. They do not think the economy as failing. They see the positive side of the situation. They see the economy as potentially succeeding. They do not see the failure, they see the success. Instead of looking at the failure, and by looking at this potential success, liberal economists, classical political economists, refuse to intervene in the functioning of the economy of the society because they do not want to impose their solutions to the uh, to the individuals who themselves are trying solutions to their problems. That's precisely what the, 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 the well, liberalism is extremely important. 
liberalism is very important because it assumes that individuals that we should start from the individuals. We should not start from the problems to solve. We should start from the individuals who are able to solve the problems. And this is the difference between the economist as a savior and the, 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 the economist as a student that the struggle for a better world makes. The economist as a savior is the economist who starts from the problem, who starts from the failure. Starting from the failures and the problems, the economist says, I am the one who has the tools to solve to fix the machine. The economy is a machine. We are able to fix the functioning of this machine. We are going to tell you how to fix the machine. We all know that this, this uh, idea is linked to Keynes, the Keynesianism, and the 1921 crisis. But Samuelson took over this idea and pushed it at the, 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 the center of the, the kind of economics he was, he, he was um, promoting. Again, it's, a, it's an inter interesting thing to uh, insist on Samuelson as uh, Pete does in the book, because Samuelson is rather frequently seen as an individualist, uh, not a pro-market economist, but as an economist who defended a, limit, a limited intervention of the state in the economy, which is, of course, totally wrong. And it's wrong also because of the consequences of that. It's wrong because Samuelson saw himself as a man, as an economist, as the, the economist who is able to fix the machine. Uh, but it's interesting that the consequence of that, and this is also a point that is uh, stressed in the book, that when you have economists who see themselves as saviors, then politicians are very happy to face experts of this kind because there is, so these economists as saviors, as the book says, work hand in hand with the politicians who want to control the machine. The economists tell the politicians, we have the tools, the politicians can use the tools to fix the machine, and no one really cares if the way to fix the machine is the best way to uh, do it. Because one of the problems that is also very clear uh, in, in the book is that the way the machine, the functioning, functioning of the economy is fixed is not necessarily the good one. One of the important points that should be uh, taught to the uh, to the students, to the people who are not really aware of the how the, the uh, liberalism works or the market works, is that certainly the intervention of the government pro produces results. It cannot be otherwise. The problem is that the inter is not that the intervention of the economist and the government produces results. The problem is that the results that are produced are certainly not the best ones and are probably the worst ones and better results, therefore a better world, could be achieved without these uh, interventions. So what can we teach to the students? What can we teach to the uh, people who are, because that's also a problem, who are afraid to be free, who are afraid to rely on the market system, is precisely that the market system is not what people think the market system is. The market is not a mechanism that leads to the establishment of a price and a quantity. A market is a social system. It's an institution, it's a social system, it's a process in which responsible individuals participate to create an outcome, an efficient allocation of resources that is not fixed. The market should be seen as a process. This very important distinction between market as an equilibrium and market as a process, which might seem to some of the people who are listening to this, this podcast, podcast obvious, is not obvious. Most economists do not understand what the difference is between market as an equilibrium and market as a process. Most of the students do not understand what the difference is. And I do not blame the students. 
by saying that. I do not want to criticize the students. I, the students do not understand the difference between the market, uh, be, between these two views on the market, because no one explains them. Because the courses they have in microeconomics, in macroeconomics, rely on this assumption that the market is a mechanism that leads to a price and a quantity of equilibrium. And once we have reached this situation, the situation is perfect. And when we are not in this situation, we have a failure. If we have a failure, we go back to the, the problem I mentioned earlier. We have the economists who are able to tell the others what to, uh, to tell the society what to do. We should see the market as a process. We should not focus on the outcome, but the process that leads to something, that leads to precisely a better world. And the market that leads to a better world is a market that involves all the citizens, all the individuals. And because all the people will also go back this loops with the idea of debate, because all the people who are involved in this institutional process, the market process, because all the people are involved, or most of the people are involved in this process, then we are achieving a situation of peace and uh, prosperity. And but peace and prosperity, not simply prosperity for a part of the situation, uh, uh, part of the society, but peace and prosperity for all. That's the point. Uh, and I think that I will stop that there because I. Uh, uh, there, there is so much to say about this book, but peace and prosperity, prosperity and peace, we cannot achieve the two independently from the other. A struggle for a better world is a struggle for a world in which there is prosperity and peace as well. And it's a struggle for a world organized around the pr principles of uh, classical liberalism. Okay, so it's really good to be invited to speak about Pete's book. I've been reading Pete's work for, and I can't quite believe I'm saying this, 30 years now. And it always leaves me with a better understanding of the case for a liberal socioeconomic order. And it also always fills me with enthusiasm to go ahead and try to do the work of making that case in better and more persuasive ways. I think both of these qualities are vividly on display in this collection of essays, The Struggle for a Better World. We have essays that spell out with great clarity what the case for a liberal market order rests on, combined with others that, though realistic about the daunting challenges that face the classical liberal movement in the present moment, brim over with enthusiasm about the case for a cosmopolitan and creative society based on what Pete refers to as true liberalism. In my remarks, I want to summarize some of the key arguments from the essays and then I want to pose two challenges that I think are left unanswered by them. So let me start off with some of the key arguments. The central argument I think found in these essays is that economics, or at least economics of what Pete calls the mainline tradition, down from Smith to Hayek, Milton Friedman and James B. Cannon, holds out a vision of a better world by explaining the dynamic but coordinating properties of a market economy working within a stable rule of law that protects persons, property, and contracts. This is a vision of a dynamic economy, but also a free economy. On this view, freedom and social coordination are not contradictory. The key to this vision is comparative institutions reasoning, combined with analytical egalitarianism. Institutions need to address knowledge problems and incentives problems, and we should not posit that some actors are born to rule over others. Classical liberals claim that markets are effective or imperfect tools that address the fallibility of human agents. They draw on the dispersed knowledge of multiple actors, knowledge that can't be centralized. They allow for permissionless innovation, and through the profit and loss system, they weed out bad decisions. Yes, there are information asymmetries and externalities, but the market generates opportunities for entrepreneurs to step in and be rewarded for addressing these very problems. In comparison to this understanding, the dominant neoclassical synthesis, based on the model of perfectly competitive general equilibrium, is deeply misleading. It obliterates the entrepreneurial function and the real world messy realities of market adjustment. 
It generates constant demands to address market imperfections or failures by holding markets to a wholly unattainable standard while neglecting to explain what equivalents to the market signaling and adjustment processes are available to fallible bureaucrats and to fallible politicians. The result of this narrative is a hampered market economy, but while still delivering more of the goods than socialism, is shot through with regulatory barriers and special interest privileges. This is the world we live in, and this is the world that what Pete calls true liberalism challenges. Now, I very much agree with all of the arguments that I've just summarized there that are in Pete's book, but I'd like to raise two challenges to them or, or pose two questions to, to Pete. The first challenge relates to the title of the book. So the book is entitled The Struggle for a Better World, but it strikes me that many of the essays read as though Pete is really asking for a struggle for a better economics, specifically an economics that isn't tied to a mechanistic model and to a series of scientific constructions that lead economists to think they are or should be social engineers. The problem that we have is that economics as we know it is scientific. This is why the economics that Pete defends is largely marginalized by the mainstream, because by their standards, it isn't scientific enough. We have a very recent example of this state of affairs with the new book from Joseph Stiglitz. This new Stiglitz volume contains many of the usual misrepresentations of arguments put forward by Milton Friedman and F.A. Hayek. But in addition to those misrepresentations, it makes the claim essentially that one of the reasons we shouldn't take these arguments seriously is that they aren't scientific enough, that they can't be mathematically formalized, that they can't be tested against the usual standards of positivist methodology that most economists still subscribe to. Now, it seems to me that if we're going to have a kind of economics that Pete defends, a better economics, it's not enough just to attack the notion that economists see themselves as scientific technocrats or as would-be social engineers. What we need is a much more full-throated attack on the entire philosophy of social science that underpins economics as a field. Economics, as it's currently practiced, is a science for robots. It operates on a predict and control model of human action, which is totally inappropriate to the analysis of real world creative individuals who are, if you like, predictably unpredictable. In Hayek's counter-revolution of science, the critique of scientism there is much more radical, I think, than the one that Peter puts forward. It rejects the entire understanding of what a, society, a science for a human society actually looks like. It rejects the whole science of modern economics in favor of something very different. I think we should look to inspiration for that different science. Two people like Ludwig Lachmann and Don Lavoy, who I know very much influenced Pete, but whose attack on scientism is much more profound, I think, than the one that Pete offers. So my question to Pete is, why don't you go the full hog and call out economics for what it is? It isn't really as currently practiced a science for human beings. We need a different type of science altogether, a different philosophy of science, if we're actually going to get the better world that Pete strives for. My second challenge relates to the vision of society that Pete is putting forward in this volume. And it's hard to make this challenge because it's also a vision I very much share. So the non-mechanistic view of human action, which underpins Pete's view, revels in the creative dynamism of the market economy. It's important to recognize that the world described in this book is a world of creative destruction. It sees the market in many ways as a kind of drama where there is excitement in profit and loss. We have more or less constant flux, struggle and contestation, not a sort of harmonious equilibrium. 
Now, this vision of a dynamic society is one that I personally find very attractive. It seems to me both more realistic in terms of a view of understanding the way human beings are, but also more attractive. It's a world of excitement and dynamism, not one of stability and security. But the challenge I want to raise is as follows. If this is our vision of what a better world looks like, how do we as classical liberals, people who essentially are arguing, who are arguing for creative destruction, engage with the growing number of people who seem to want a different type of world, a world characterized by stability, security, and by tradition. If we want to get that better world, we need to have a way of communicating with the people who want that stability, that security, and that tradition. The question I pose to Pete is, do we have a way of communicating with those people? Or are our visions so totally opposed to one another that we can't actually find the reconciliation that the better world can actually be achieved? Thank you. Let me start by saying that, um, you know, one of the things that's most amazing about this uh, opportunity here is that you guys actually, in your comments, made my book better than it actually is. So I'm, I'm thrilled. And, and each and every one of you have uh, very important insights uh, that um, could lead to a really great discussion about where we have to go forward in building this. But uh, I'm going to start with uh, Mark's. Mark, there's this great debate that took place in Harper's Magazine in March of 2023 on does liberalism have a future? And it's Cornell West, Patrick Deneen, Frank Fukuyama, and Deirdre McCloskey. And McCloskey is the only one who defends liberalism as a future. And so it's exactly what you're talking about, especially Patrick Deneen. As you know, this is a big movement that's going on. And this is this idea that we need to have a government that has a telos and a society and all these things like that. And, you know, to me, when I hear it, I'm horrified, right? I mean, like my first reaction is like, you can't possibly want to have that. That's like a theocracy, you know, running around or whatever. But I will tell you the following thing as well, which is that we recently had a podcast with Timur Koran's, you know, book and Jim Robinson, you know, uh, was one of the commentators. And he started his comment by saying, look, you know, I, I share all of Timur's, you know, concerns about liberal society. And but aren't we presuming that what people want is liberalism? But when we look at the data right now, one of the things that we see is that countries aren't democratizing. There's actually there's more movements towards autocracies than there are towards democracies. And so what's going on in the world? And we presume, oh, liberalism means progress. But to a lot of people, it doesn't. So how do we make that argument resonate with the younger uh, generation and, and the possibilities for a, for a better world? That, I think, is a major task that, you know, all of us, uh, you know, and Emily in particular, you know, is embracing that. I mean, that is the, the IHS, you know, problem. That is, you know, in your country, the IEA problem. How do we you know, get people to understand this broader notion of a dynamic and, and liberal society and embrace it. You know, Randy Holcomb in his book on political capitalism has this great line where he says, you always have to remember the dif difference between those who want to get ahead and those who are ahead. He goes, those who are ahead hate creative destruction because what it will mean is that they're no longer in, the, in their power and privilege. But those who want to get ahead, they love creative destruction, right? And so in some sense, we are celebrating the idea that there should be this constant churn of people. It's like with Buchanan to Arrow telling him, no, 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 you know, your stability result would be a, a permanent winning coalition. The way democracy really works is through churning. It's the actual cycling is actually the good of democracy rather than the bad. And to me, I think that, that we need, we have those arguments. We have Julian Simon. We have all these other people who have laid out the consequences of a dynamic society. But yet we haven't yet kind of really influenced the conversation at the level that we would hope to. So that just means that we need to stare in the mirror and say to ourselves, what are we not communicating better than we could so that we could maybe resonate with, with uh, the younger people in that regard? That's part of the struggle, right? Because it's an ongoing struggle intellectually. 
How do I, you know, have these different things? I I, uh, I recently did a podcast with Tyler on his uh, book, Stubborn Attachments, uh, for Liberty Fund. And one of the things that's interesting in that book, as you'll know, Mark, is uh, that, uh, you know, Tyler's two thirds a utilitarian, one third, you know, rights person, right? And if you remember, you know, Jeff Friedman criticized, you know, modern libertarian types like myself and others, but, you know, as playing this, what he called the libertarian two-step, which is that when the natural rights argument runs into a dead end, we go to utilitarianism. And when utilitarianism runs into a dead end, we jump to natural rights or whatever. But to me now, as I've gotten older, I think to myself, what's wrong with being really good at the two-step? <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe we should embrace that. Maybe Jeff, you know, the, you know, he wanted a purity of the doctrine. And maybe that, you know, yes, you know, and of course, the way it was presented by a lot of libertarians at the time was that they were striving for a purity of a doctrine. Think of Rothbard or Rand, you know, and they, you know, you dudes from, you know, A to Z and you can, you know, the non-aggression axiom, you have the whole thing. And so maybe Jeff's criticism, you know, hit them. But at the same time, let's just use an example of Nozick. You know, we read Nozick, you know, you're, you're in this field, you know, Nozick is you know, still this creative mind that gave us this book. And if you think about that book and you break it down, the first part of the book on invisible hand explanations, that's consequentialist. The last part of the book on, you know, the democratic vision, right, of, of, of you know, what does the demos look like, that's, that's utilitarian consequentialism too. Then you get to the middle part of the book, rights as trumps, but he also has process versus end states, right? So here's the, the great people that in fo political philosophy they think is the defender of, of rights-based arguments in libertarianism, but he actually is reasoning like Hayek and, you know, uh, Mises and all these other thinkers. So to me, I think, you know, let's embrace the two-step. <laughs> you know, maybe that's the way to go forward to sort of embrace this dynamism because we can, as Alain, you know, said, demonstrate that you can have the consistency of the respect for the individual and their autonomy at the same time, as well as generating peace and prosperity. At least that's the, the argument. The, sec the first point, I, I plead guilty, and I agree with you 100%. Uh, this is the reason why Hayek ended up by turning to the counter-revolution, is because, he, and it's the reason why Lavoie turned to hermeneutics. You know, Don Lavoie, you know, very successfully could have just kept on going as a comparative economics person. And as Emily and I know, because we lived through it, Don was frustrated. You know, people weren't understanding the subtle points about knowledge generation, epistemic institutions, things like that. And just like Hayek, he argued, oh, the reason why you don't get it is because you have a bad theory. The reason why you have a bad theory is because you have a bad philosophy of science. So if you think again about Emily's four four pillars, you know, that Polanyi S notion of the way science must operate in a free society is critical to us. But that isn't like Popper's three by five card. And it's not the kind of, you know, operationalism or uh, instrumentalism that is practiced by economists. OK. And so to me, I think, you know, you're 100 percent on board. I did not address methodological issues in that in that book, except for maybe in the the, the uh, a couple papers. I mean, the one, you know, okay, so I, I, I don't want to belabor this, but here's the thing that I try to capture in the, the role of economists in a free society uh, essay, which is Hayek in his Nobel says the following thing. I always love this, right? He gets, wins a Nobel Prize. He has to give a toast at the opening dinner. He says, if I had been asked whether or not econ economics should have a Nobel Prize, I would have said no. And the reason is, is that no economist should be given this platform. Thank you very much. Cheers, right? Then the next day he comes, he starts his lecture by saying, one, we have made, we economists have nothing to be proud of. We made a mess of things. Why did we make a mess of things? We made a mess of things because we have the wrong theory. Why do we have the wrong theory? Because we have the wrong philosophy of science, right along the lines that you just laid out, right? Then he says that unless we fix things, we are going to turn economics into a den of charlatans, actually uses that term, charlatans. And if we don't fix this charlatan practice, we're going to actually risk becoming tyrants over our fellow uh, citizens 
and destroyers of the very civilization. Thank you for your prize. I love it. And then he goes, I, I actually don't think anyone else who's won the Nobel Prize in economics, and there are some people who were pretty harsh in their thing. I don't think anyone's been as harsh as Hayek on the practice of economics. And I give him a lot of credit for that. Buchanan, of course, was another one who was harsh, right? Right in the, in the first paragraph, we must uh, cease pro-offering advice as if to a benevolent despot. I'm here to tell you, you've been doing it all wrong, right? Because of these utilitarian, social engineering, elitist presumption that you're engaging. So uh, to me, I think you're, you're, you're you know, spot on that we need to, to address that issue. And, you know, hopefully, you know, I, I'm, I'm sitting here staring at a, a off print of a recent paper of mine called The Fate of Moral Philosophy in the, Day, in the Age of Economic Scientism. And it's actually the title of a book I want to write. And I hope to surprise people with that book because I hope to focus on uh, Boulding and um, Hirschman and Sen and not Hayek and Buchanan. But I want to have Hayek and Buchanan kind of like the bookends of it. But in the middle, it's going to be these individuals because those were three individuals that, like Buchanan and Hayek, strove to have a moral philosophy in the age of scientism. And so how is it that they wrestled with those ideas? And I think this is the issue, the recapturing of the moral sciences. And that relates to Alon's point about uh, the way that I think of teaching economics and of communicating economic ideas within the economics profession. Because rather than viewing the economists as these technocrats, I view them as, as moral philosophers. And therefore, rather than economics as a tool of social control, it can only be understood as a tool of social understanding and of social criticism. And so how do we get the discourse back to that level when the demand for our subject is to be a tool of social control? And, and that's a, a big issue. On uh, Emily's uh, four uh, pillars of liberalism, as she knows, I think this argument of hers um, is very, very important. And like hits the nail right on the head. And I love the way she even aligns the different schools of thinking. And one of the questions that struck me when I was listening to Emily, because this is something that always gets asked to me, because I don't always appreciate people in uh, that are free market. Like there are uh, free market people, very successful free market people that I don't include in the main line of economics. And historically, when people ask me about this, I say, listen, because the way mainline should be understood is that you have two propositions, the invisible hand proposition and the rational choice postulate. And the main line of economics is one that derives the invisible hand proposition from the rational choice postulate via institutions. So I always tend to focus on the institutional. And in the essay in this book, which is on economics and public administration, I describe it as Plot's fundamental you know, uh, equation, right? Individuals plus institutions equal outcomes. And so the question is, is you're going to freeze people, explain the variation in outcomes by the variation in the institutions. That's your comparative institution stuff. And so why is it? So that's how I always describe it. But at, what Emily makes me think about is that one of the reasons why I describe it that way is precisely because those who emphasize the institutions understand the four pillars. And so the Austrian school is not, they never argued that you could have economic processes that were disembodied from politics, law, and society. All right. And so the intellectual liberalism of Polanyi, which explains the growth of knowledge in society, that's an essay Hayek actually commission him to write for Economica, right? And so it's like these things are all interconnected to create this moral science that we understand. We could call it Smithian, we could call it whatever, right? But that moral science that links those four pillars, and there's a lot of economists, even those who share free market presumptions, that don't see these other three pillars. And they think that you can talk about the economy in purely technical terms. and I think that that's, a, that's another way to think on this idea of institutions. Um, because again, like, you know, Deirdre has criticized me 
for focusing too much on institutions, as you might know. But in my mind, I don't understand her argument, to be honest, because to me, institutions are both the formal and informal rules of the game and the formal and informal sanctions, right? So this is the informal sanctions would be moral approbation and disapprobation that Smith talks about. That's exactly her virtues, right? This is, you know, when she lays out the sort of bourgeois virtues, right? This is all about social approbation and disapprobation. And when she says the bourgeois equality, because we now came to give respect to those who were wanting to give it a go, well, that, you know, the free society works best when the need for a policeman or a preacher is least. Because why? Because we've internalized those norms and everything like that. So to me, the institution based explanation includes her in it, I mean, as a central part of it, because the transaction costs of enforcing an institution that doesn't fit with these virtues is going to end up by being astronomical and therefore not adopted, right? And so this is why we need to address these questions. But I have not been back to the argument again about how successful. I have been completely unable to persuade Deirdre that she's an ally in this, not a, a um, uh, you know, a contender, right? She's like a central ally in what I'm trying to do. So again, I think maybe Emily's four pillars is a better, a more richer framework to hang it on rather than uh, just the issue of institutions in the middle you know, preferences, institutions, outcomes. Maybe what I, I have to dig, maybe we have to dig much deeper into what the hell we mean by institutions and, and that. The last thing I'll say, uh, just to Alon, is I do think the appropriate term, Alon, should be discussion, not debate. And the reason for this is something very familiar with you. It, it goes back to night, uh, right? And, and the issue of intelligence and democratic action which means that in order to have reasonable discourse, we have to knock out manipulative discourse, deceptive discourse, motivated discourse, right? And instead, and I think those issues of motivation, motivated reasoning, manipulative reasoning, deceptive reasoning, they are tricks in a debate. So we all know people who, who did high school debate and are very smart and they can win <laughs> debates all the time. You put them up, you know, boom, 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 they can knock you down because they know all the tricks of the trade. But that's not a genuine conversation. A genuine conversation is one, as Lavoie always used to stress, this idea of actually sort of, you know, fusion of the minds or horizon, right? It's like we're debating, we're learning from one another. And things like that. I think that the kind of democracy by discourse that we would like to generate is one that's closer to that. And that's why I use the Dennett, the Dennett rules in the book and also the Ed Schill's point, this is in the last chapter, about civility, because I, I actually think that for us to have the kind of cosmopolitan liberal society, we have to have at the highest levels of whatever we call governance has to be the most civil. We can tolerate parochial reasoning at a very local re level, because precisely the way Emily put it, there's so much contestation, or the way Nozick puts it, right? We would just, you know, Falwellville versus Fondaville, right? We would just migrate with our feet and move to the different ones. But, and so that's the contestation, or the way I would view like Kukathos's work, which is to me, you know, fundamental to this project. And so it's all about contestation at the local level. But in order to have that, you have to have this umbrella of civility, of mutual respect, of, of things like that. And so that's what's missing at the moment is that we've allowed the parochial to become at the highest levels. And so that's what leads to all this. This is mainly U.S. centric because that's what I know better than others. But that's where you have all this divisiveness and rancor and everything is at the highest levels, you know, rather than at the local level. So rather than. And so we have to actually fix that. And I'm not quite sure how to do that, but I'll end with this, which is one of the biggest, this is simple, but it's, it's a very simple-minded position uh, at some level. And that is, is that I think that we have to be champions of non-zero-sumness. And the issue that's happened over the last 20 years is a 
ironically, a great victory of zero-sum thinking. Uh, and in particular, zero-sum thinking at like a meta level. We divide the world into to groups that are in opposition to one another, and one can only win if the other one loses, rather than, and it doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left. I, you know, uh, Stephanie might might think I'm a little uh, over the top when I use this this metaphor, but I, I always remember, you know, Orwell said that the future of humanity was a giant boot stepping on its face, right? And I always like to say it doesn't matter right now whether or not that boot is on the re- right foot or the left foot. It's like both of those are still boots stepping on the face of humanity. And so we need to, you know, we need to address this issue about the non-zero sumness and of our social interactions. And again, I think that all of the different points that you guys have pulled out from the book, and even in the, the phrase that you used, Mark, a, 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 the cosmopolitan and creative society, I could say that better by using those terms more in this book than I do, uh, even though that's obviously what I'm all in favor of. I think there's a better way to state it. So you guys have all given me great hope that I should write a follow-up book uh, on this. So, um, and uh, I'll steal all your ideas. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Great. Thank you all so much for a great discussion. And the readers dig into the book, follow some of the insights that you guys have talked about and continue to struggle in these ideas as well. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.